Simulation nodes have been merged into the main branch of Blender 3.6, and this is very exciting because it opens up a whole new world of effects that were previously inaccessible. In this tutorial, we'll be walking through how to create this particle collision effect using the index of nearest node, another new addition to Blender which unlocks a vast range of particle-based physics simulations. Starting with the basics in this video, we'll build up the techniques necessary to create these animations over a series of tutorials. If you'd like to follow along, please subscribe and turn on notifications. There's a link to the blend file in the description if you'd like to grab that, and let's get started. The general function of the simulation is to satisfy certain constraints placed on the particles within each simulation step. Along with their velocity, particle positions are directly manipulated by these constraints, and the difference between each particle's position at the beginning and the end of the simulation step is used to determine the updated velocity for each particle. In each step, there are three main stages. First, the position of each particle is changed according to its velocity vector. Second, each particle is moved so that it's not colliding with other particles through a series of particle collision correction movement steps. And then third, particle positions are changed to reflect collisions with the larger spherical collider as well as the circular boundary. Before we start the simulation, we need to create some particles and initialize their positions. This is done with these three nodes which create a filled mesh circle, distribute points randomly on the face of the circle, and initialize the radius of each point or particle as we're calling them. Moving to the simulation block, we first capture the position attribute at the beginning of the simulation step. We'll use this at the end of the step to calculate the new velocity. Next, we set the position of each particle by offsetting it by the velocity vector. After this step, the particles may have moved in such a way that they overlap. The collision steps node group moves overlapping particles away from each other to reduce this overlap. We perform 10 of these steps to minimize the average overlap between particles as much as possible in each iteration of the simulation. Each collision step uses the index of nearest node to find the index of the particle closest to the particle currently being operated on, and then the evaluate index node with the position node as an input to get the position of that closest particle. The position of the nearest particle is then subtracted from the position of the current particle to get the vector that points from the nearest particle to the current particle. And then the length is taken to determine whether or not the two particles overlap by comparing this length, which is the distance between the two particles, to two times the particle radius. If the particles overlap, then the current particle is moved away from the nearest particle by a small amount. It should be noted that the correction vector can be calculated in different ways, such as finding the exact offset for removing the overlap between the two particles by using the difference of the distance between the particles and two times their radius. But we'll take a bit of artistic license here and tune the simulation to our liking. The correction vector is then multiplied by a 110 vector to zero out the z value because this is a two dimensional simulation. And finally, we offset the position of the current particle in the input geometry by the correction vector. Next, we have the collider and boundary steps. The collider step checks to see if the current particle overlaps with the collider represented by this sphere. And if it does, the position of the particle is set relative to the collider so that no overlap exists. This is done by normalizing the vector between the particle position and the collider position and scaling the normalized vector by the size of the collider plus the radius of the particle. This offset vector is then added to the position of the collider and the Z component is again removed to keep the simulation two dimensional. The boundary step works in a similar way, but instead corrects the particle position if it is greater than the boundary radius rather than lesser than it. Additionally, the correction vector for the boundary collision doesn't take into account the particle radius only because it's not needed for this particular effect. The last part of the simulation step is calculating the velocity based on the difference between the current particle position and the last particle position. So we pipe in the last position that we captured at the outset of the simulation step, subtract that from the current position to get the new velocity, scale the new velocity so that the particles slow down a bit over time, and then mix the old velocity with the new one by some factor, in this case 0.25, so that the velocity has some staying power over time. Lastly, the speed of the particle is clamped to the particle radius, which helps to maintain a stable simulation. Now jumping back out of the simulation loop, we prepare our animation for rendering by using an instance on points node to instance an icosphere geometry 
that is set to shade smooth onto each particle of this simulation. And then we use a set material node to set the material of each particle to the particle material, which we will go over now. This material uses the velocity attribute to determine the color of each particle. We get the length of the velocity vector, which represents the speed of the particle, and then use some math nodes along with a color ramp node to find a range of values that displays the speed of each particle in a visually appealing way. Here we use a principled BSDF shader node with the subsurface value set to 1 and our speed based color piped into the subsurface color socket. As for lighting, we use two sunlights, also known as directional lights, each set with a widespread angle and pointing in different directions. And that just about covers it. Stay tuned for the tutorials coming up on doing more complex particle based physics simulations using Blender. We'll be covering 3D simulations, friction, and setting up distance constraints which allow us to create strings of particles, cloth, and soft bodies. We'll also discuss different ways to dynamically remove constraints between particles to simulate breaking, tearing, and splitting. There are a lot of little details and tweaks involved in getting the desired result in each simulation, and it's helpful to have a solid understanding of how the systems work to achieve a particular effect. Position-based dynamics is a technique that anyone can get the hang of with a little bit of time and effort, and it's a lot of fun to mess around with, so I hope you stick with it. I also hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope that you learned something, and above all, I hope you had fun. Until next time, bye.